Hello everyone, my name is Joanna Daniel. I'm founder of Fonsless Cars and I am a counselor, speaker and an author. And today I am talking about the Christian's Guide to Healing from Sexual Abuse. The Christian Guide to Healing from Sexual Abuse. So I must let you know, if you hear like a howling or some sounds, we are still in a storm um, here in Wales. There are trees in my garden that's broken down. And so if you hear something, that's going to be what's going on outside, okay? So why am I talking about the Christian's Guide to Healing from Sexual Abuse? And if, you, if, you're, if you're new to this channel, if you go back and watch some of my videos, then you know that I talk about sexual trauma a lot. I talk about domestic abuse a lot. I talk about other types of trauma, but sexual trauma, I talk about that a lot. And in, I, think, I think it was part two of a series that I've just completed, Cultivating the Fruits of the Spirit Despite Emotional Pain. And I particularly honed in on sexual abuse because it's important. And as, if you are one of the one in four that experience sexual trauma, you understand. If you are not one of the one in four that experience sexual trauma, stick around and you know, listen to some of the, the things that are present for women who experience sexual trauma and why it's so important. So why am I, why do we need a guide? Why do Christians need a guide? And do we need a different guide to what a non-Christian needs? Perhaps not, but there's something that's really important in a guide that we have that we need that is important for us to know about, right? So as Christians, when we I know for sometimes Christian women come to me for counseling, come to wounds the scars after having gone to secular counselors. And though my colleagues in in who are counselors who are not Christian do amazing work, one of the things that Christian women will say is, I didn't feel like I could bring that part of me. And so that's why there's this, there's this thing that we need to talk about. And so that's why I feel like the guy that we need, need to include scripture. And how do we do that? How do we put that in without spiritualizing sexual abuse? We don't want to do that. We also don't want to spiritualize pain. We don't want to spiritualize healing, but we need to know where to place it. Where does it, where does it fit? Does it fit? Does it have a place? Does God have something to say about it? And what does he have to say? And how does that how, does, how can that help me on my healing journey? So one of the things that is really, really a feature of sexual abuse and it's shame. Shame. People who experience sexual abuse, we wear shame like here, like we feel everybody can know, everybody can see it. Everybody think, you know, that the self-esteem gets real damage, low self-worth and confidence and a host of other things. And so I want to start with reading this first. It's a favorite of mine and I use it a lot when I do groups and when I do my retreats or even here, you might hear me quote it before. And it's Isaiah 61 verse seven to nine. Instead of shame, you shall have double honor. And instead of confusion, they shall rejoice in their portion. You know, um, and verse eight says, for I, the Lord love justice. I hate robbery for burnt offering. I will direct their work in truth and I will make them an everlasting covenant. But the first part I want you to focus on, instead of shame, you shall have double honor. And there's several places throughout scripture that he promises to heal our wounds and restore health. So what kind of guy do we need? I want us to think about sexual abuse also, as well as a religious piece in a religious context and knowing where what God says about it. How does he feel about me being hurt? And what are some of the things that, does he care about my pain? Because sometimes the language we can get in Christian settings is dismissive of pain. I've heard, you know, somebody has told me that a woman who was traumatized sexually shouldn't have a problem, she should just pray. And a lot of times, women are not healing because they feel like they should just pray. And because they're praying and the pain is not going, they feel like they're doing something wrong. And if they should just become better people spiritually, then they pain, their pain will disappear. And if you've done any kind of healing work or listens to my videos at all, you'll know that prayer is a part of healing, but prayer is not the whole part of healing because prayer is action. And when we're praying, we have to be prepared to listen. Prayer is not a monologue where like, I am talking to you via the screen. Prayer is dialogue. Prayer is the ability to listen to God and to hear him, what he says, and be prepared to do that thing. So prayer is 
God, you going to God with the pain that you're feeling around the sexual abuse, you having the courage and the ability to say, God, this happened to me. This is how I'm feeling today. I had flashbacks last night. I experienced memories and they're, they're, they're devastating. And today I feel crippled. I can't get out of bed. And God's saying, I hear you, Joanna. I want you to call Wounds the Scars and I want you to ask for counseling. I want you to talk to somebody. I want you to join that group. I want you to read this book. I want you to be able to listen to this podcast and you being obedient and following through and doing that. So prayer is the ability to listen to God, what he says and do what he says. So it's not just about us going to him with the stuff, but he, he wants to direct our path. He wants to tell us where to go. He wants to tell us who to go to because he has his people that he's prepared to, to, um, to listen to us and to help us. So when we experience sexual abuse, there's a lot of after effects. There's a lot of shame and the shame occur on different levels. It can be complex. And there are ways that we manage that shame by sometimes we bury, bury ourselves deeper in religious work. We get busy at church, we get busy at work. Sometimes we move from one relationship to the next. Sometimes we struggle with forming healthy relationships. Um, sometimes we use food, pornography, different things to cope, all in an effort, all in an effort to silence the voice, to silence the pain. We feel it's going to deaden the nightmares and we are going to be, it, this is the thing that's going to help us. And it's often because there's a message that counseling is wrong, you shouldn't need it. But I want to tell you that if you have experienced sexual trauma, you really need help to heal. And healing, healing is not intellectual. It's feeling is involved. There's a, the mind and the body so closely connected. So you need to be able to feel what you experience, to be able to feel what the pain feels like, to be able to, as you're listening to this, you might be, you might be re-traumatized. There's some people who can't listen to it because the name alone is, is triggering. And because of that, you can't listen. Um, there are sometimes when we experience sexual trauma, that touch is, a, is an issue. And we, we can't bear to be touched. And because of that, sometimes our relationships, our marriages crumble as a result. Now that is a normal, natural thing, not the crumbling part, but the fact that touch is an issue. When we were touched without our permission, without our, we, you know, you didn't give permission or say so, and it happens anyway. And so now that you're grown up, the one thing that you have control over is who and when, um, and, and that is used to protect yourself. And so, so it's important to know what's going on so that you can begin to heal, so that you can, the relationships that you have now that you care about, that you can show up in those relationships as a heal whole person. Now, I want to go back to the shame because I want to tie it to, if you read the last chapters in Matthew and the last scenes of Jesus's life, those of us who experience sexual trauma will be able to identify with some of the things in that last scene of his life, that last week of his life, the darkness that he experienced, the, the, the company, the, 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 the people who he took with him in the garden of Gethsemane and how he wanted them to, to pray with him and to be with him, how the, the humiliation as he goes into Pilate's judgment hall and Herod, how they spat in his face, they stripped him of his clothes, they beat him in the open, people jeer him. If you think about what that might feel like as you go through that process and some of the stuff that you go through when, when he said, Father, why have you forsaken me? There are many times when women experience sexual abuse were asked, where was God? Why, why did he forsake me? Why didn't he do something? Why didn't he defend me? Why didn't he stop the perpetrators from hurting me? So for us, having a guide means coming home to that place where we can learn how to trust that God cares about the pain, that he is not unconcerned, that he's not distant, and that he's not uncaring, but that he cares. In our group Storm Chaser, we looked at Isaiah 40, verse 1 to 11 recently, a couple of weeks ago. And verse 2 is just so fitting here where he says, comfort ye my people, comfort. When we experience sexual trauma, comfort is really important. And we, we can trust God to know that he's capable of comforting us because he experienced everything. 
Um, Isaiah 55 verse 4, I think, says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. And so I, I think I did verse four and five there. But because he experienced everything, the humiliation, the shame, the rejection, the abandonment, the, the stripping, the, all of that, that he experienced, the darkness that he went through and asked, Father, why have you forsaken me? the friends who left him and was no longer walking with him. Those things, because one of the fundamental things that got damaged when we experience sexual trauma is trust. Trust, so we have shame, we have, we have trust, we have self-esteem, we have self-worth, all of those things get damaged. And we can grow up and become qualified, well, well um, articulated, adjusted people, and the pain sits there and it manifests itself in relationships. It manifests itself in communication. It manifests itself in how we show up at work. It manifests itself in how we are in groups. It manifests itself in how we see ourselves and view ourselves, love ourselves, our ability to love ourselves. And also it impacts trust in such a deep way that we don't trust God. And I'm speaking to Christians. And even though we go to church, even though we might participate in church and serve in church, in varying capacities, if you were to investigate beneath the layer of pain that you've tried to hide with doing and being and other things, you will see that I don't really trust him to manage this pain. I don't really trust him to walk with me through it. I don't really trust him to heal, to heal me. And that's really what's, what's the issue. And that's why we need a guide for Christians. Because the guide is not to, this is not apologetics. This is not recommending God to you. This is not, this is an invitation to heal so that you can heal that relationship so that you can fully trust him to take care of you throughout life with, with whatever that you're experiencing. Uh, a woman I just spoke to, a, a therapist who's going to speak at our, our conference March 25 to 27, was just telling me her journey of healing from something else, but the path that she took to, though she had to stop going to church for six months, the path that she took to restoring her connection with God and the path that he led her to through to healing, but you'll have to come to the conference to hear some more. So the, I, I'm, I'm saying that to say, this is not apologetics. This is not, this is not telling you that you should trust. This is, this is because I know that trust is damaged. I know that shame is a big thing. I know that forgiveness is an issue. I, I know that touch is an issue, so it damages our relationships. I know that there are cultural nuances around it. I know that the religious piece plays a massive part in people's ability to heal or inability to heal or people's willingness to go for support. And so if I were to give you a guide, I would say when you're praying, listen for the direction ask who should I go to to start this journey of healing ask where should I go who do you recommend and be prepared to listen for the answer be prepared to be challenged that the answer that he gives might challenge you might challenge you to grow in your faith in such a way because we grow in our faith when we make a decision to act on the things that he told us to act when he says do this. And I said, okay, I don't, I don't know how to do it. I'm afraid, but I'm going to act anyway. So your faith grows through that process and you become grow, you become strengthened as you listen, you hear, and you act. And so listen to where he wants to go. He wants you to go. Look at the places in your life where sexual trauma is affecting. Look at how shame has, what, what have, what are the cost of shame to you? What does it cost you? What has it stopped you from doing? What has fear and lack of self-worth stops you from accomplishing in your life? And if you can connect it to the sexual trauma and often it's connected to there, look at how much it has cost you in your life and what are you prepared to give it moving forward? Would an would healing help to restore that cost? Will healing help to restore your sense of self, your trust? 
would healing help to restore how you see yourself and build your self-esteem, your self-worth in Christ? Would healing help to take away shame and would healing set you free? So look at the cost for you. Look at how much it costs you. Look at the cost for, you know, the last scenes of Jesus's life in, in the last couple of chapters of Matthew and look at Isaiah 61 and where he says he will restore shame and he will give you double honor. Look at Isaiah 41 verse two and he says he wants to comfort you and look at those things. Listen and ask him, where should I go to get support? Who have you gifted with the abilities to help me do this journey of healing because I'm tired of being in pain. I'm tired of the shame. I'm tired of the lack of trust and, and whatever else you're tired of and asking for to direct you in how you should walk your journey of healing. But I want you to know that despite what anybody tells you about going to counseling, about therapeutic support, about needing help, about prayer, all you need to do is do prayer and Bible study. I want you to know that that's not true, but I want you, I, don't, I could tell you what it is, not because I'm a counselor, but because I believe this to be true, but I want you to go, go sit and listen and ask for direction and guidance so you can get your instructions and you can be prepared to act on your instructions. All right, have a great week. Take good care.